You may be seated, and as you're seated, the truth of Christ's example, resisting Satan with God's word, is the lesson the Ephesians learn. Now, from these little three verses we read, three and a half verses, you don't really see that. You just see the commendation. But if we go back, and let's go back to the book of Ephesus, uh, the book to Ephesus, the book of the Ephesians, believers, starting in chapter 2, I want to give you a lesson in seeing the prime example that the Ephesians were of learning to live in an evil world. Now, we also need to learn to live in an evil world. Our world, we don't have one solid block, gold column, temple of prostitution in Kalamazoo or in Michigan. Uh, we, we do have a lot of other edifices that are, that are monuments to sin, but, but we don't have anything quite like this largest building of the ancient world. But we do live in an evil world. And the lessons that the Ephesians learn in the midst of all this debauchery was that Jesus Christ could plant a church and that church could be well-pleasing to God. And these Ephesian believers that that we're going to read about in, in the book that was written to the Ephesians were those who were well-pleasing. And they got the first of Christ's personal letters. And in this letter, we see reflected the best part of the city of Ephesus. Jesus shined out through these Ephesian believers. Jesus had a light that that shone brightly in the darkness of this Greco-Roman world and their decadent culture. In fact, if you read the the little run-up to the book of the Ephesians in the book of Acts, Uh, you find this was a vibrant church. You don't have to go to Acts, but it says in Acts 19 that Jesus Christ was preeminent in this church, that at the founding of the church, fear fell on them all, and the name of Jesus was magnified. That's what it says in Acts 19.17. So at the founding of this church, Christ was preeminent. They had a galaxy of great speakers. They had the Apostle Paul. They had Apollos who came through. They had John who lived there. They had Mary who lived there. They had Timothy who pastored them for a long time. But but it was Christ who was preeminent in this church. That was the vibrancy of this church. The Ephesian church was started by believers whose lives had been deeply changed. If you remember, Acts 19 says that the founding of this church was when Paul came and preached to them about the power of Christ, the people became convicted of their witchcraft. They had all these books and and different methods that they used in occultic events and activities that they participated in. And they came, and if you remember in Acts 19, they burned this huge pile of magical art books and all this stuff that that was involved with the occult. And and because of that, Acts 19, 18 and 19 says that many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them. These Ephesian Christians from the beginning, when they received Christ, made a public renunciation of their old lives because God's word was prominent in this church. And it says in Acts 19.20 that the word of God grew and prevailed. So the run up to the book that we love so much to read, the book to the Ephesians in Acts 19, the run up to this church is that they were powerfully influenced by the word of God. They were repentant of their past and they publicly burned all the accoutrements, all the, the relics of their old life. And so we could describe this early church by what Christ's word within them produced in their lives. And starting in chapter 2 of Ephesians in verse 3, we could say that Christ's word in them helped them to resist immorality. Because of Christ's word in them, they resisted the immorality that was in that one city block building. And they were new creations in Christ. They had repented of their past lives. Look at verse 3. It says, Among whom we also had our conversation in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But notice what the beginning of the verse says, in times past. You see, they had repented. They had turned. You know what repentance means? It means a change of mind that changes our behavior. We are headed this way and our minds are saying this is what we want, we're living for. And when we when we are confronted by the claims of Christ, we turn from our wicked ways. Our mind says 
that is wrong. So our behavior, energized by God's grace, goes in a different direction. In fact, it says of another church in the first century, the church in Thessalonica, it says how you turn to God from idols. Repentance in the Bible is always a turn from this direction to a new direction. Now, sometimes we struggle. Sometimes we're kind of like Lot's wife. We're looking back and, and we're defeated and we're tempted and we're drawn back. But born again Christians have repented. Uh, it means that, that we've had a change of mind. We, we've looked at our old life. We've heard the gospel of Christ and we've responded in faith to Christ. And that change of mind has changed our direction. So they had repented. The culture of Ephesus was overtly wicked. They were saved and living every day in what could be described as sin city. These Ephesians vividly portrayed resistance to that magnificent palace of sin and immorality, the temple of Diana. There was in Ephesus a culture that had a very strong tug of immorality. It, it, it was the magnet. This temple of Diana was a magnet. In fact, Bonnie and I, uh, I think it was last March, a year ago right now, we, we had a whole boatload of people that were going around doing a Holy Land tour, and, and we took our little bus off this boat. And we, when we went to Ephesus, it was just unbelievable. The, the uh, Turkish guide that, that led us around got the whole group together on the street of this huge, huge archaeological remain. And they've only opened up a little part of the big city it was. And the, the archaeologist guide had everybody real quiet, and he says, look, right there. And, and one of the, he says, one of the people was actually standing on what he was pointing at. And so they backed up, and we all looked down, and in the very stones of the streets of Ephesus were carved, and, and the guide showed us several different carvings. There was a carving that represented homosexual prostitution. So if you were homosexual, you would look on the street and you'd find this little symbol. And if you followed the little symbols, you'd end up in front of a door where there would be homosexuality available for sale. There was another symbol that was for heterosexual immorality. And if you looked down close enough, you'd find that and you'd follow those and there would be that place. There were these symbols that were chiseled right into the streets. So every day when you went to work, every day when you went to the market, Every day as you went to school or to the doctor's office, you were walking on top of symbols that were chiseled right into the streets to tug you toward immorality. Now, that's blatant immorality. Now, what I thought was interesting was that after they got all done, I pointed out that also chiseled in the street near a lot of these were the ancient Christian symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, that the believers, I believe, had had gotten down and chiseled into the, the stone pavers the fact that Jesus Christ has set me free from following that symbol toward that door. You see, there was a, a strong influence, not only this tug of immorality, but of Christ's transformation. But all day long, in the confines of this city, this immorality was tugging at people. Look at chapter 2, verse 10, because these, these people had been ministered to by Paul's ministry. By the way, you're, when you read the, the book of Ephesians, this was written 40 years before the book of the Revelation. So when Jesus wrote in chapter 2, you Ephesians, I commend you for what you've done, they were responding to 40 years of the teaching ministry that the letter to the Ephesians had had in their lives. And they had repented of their past lives, verse 3. But look at verse 10. They believed and saw that they had their calling in Christ. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, not to follow the, the chiselings toward the old lives that we'd repented of, but we are called in Christ to good works. And, and keep going to chapter 4. It's over the page, verse 22. They had learned from Paul... The spiritual secret of putting off and putting on. What Paul said to them is that you put off your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So first you put off, you consciously repent of, verse 22, the old way, 
the old following the chisel marks in the in the pavement or whatever they were doing. And then you be renewed, verse 23, in the spirit of your mind. You say, Lord, I want to obey you. Lord, I want you to change my mind. I want to agree with you. In fact, we had a great lesson. Uh, we were eating lunch together as a family this week, and we were reading our, our little chapter that we read. And I said, let's have a little lesson. You know, every day we, that, that we meet with the children and talk to them about one facet of, of the Lord. And I said, the, the lesson this week is, what do you do when you get upset at each other and, and you don't get along? And, and so I said, the first thing you do is you have to tell the Lord that you were wrong. You have to say, Lord, I want to put off the way I'm acting, being angry or, or selfish or whatever. And, Lord, I want you to change me. And I said, as soon as you do that, you go to the person that you hurt. And you say to them, I was wrong. I am sorry. Please forgive me. Did you know those nine words are the most powerful words? They can change any marriage. They can change any parenting situation. They can change any friendship. Nine of the most powerful words in the world. I was wrong. I am sorry. Please forgive me. You know, a lot of times we think those, we don't say them. In relational work within other people, we can't just think those words. For our relationships to work, we have to say, I was wrong. And we agree with God. See, we agree with God, verse 22, about our former conduct. We say that we were corrupt. And then verse 23, we say, I want you to renew me. I want you to change my mind. Do you remember what repentance is? It's a change of mind that leads to a change of behavior. It starts with the mind. It starts with me saying, I want to put off this corrupting influence in my life. And I want to be renewed. And I want keep going to verse 24. It's, it's not enough to put off and be renewed. We have to, thirdly, put on the new man which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. And then what he does is, the Apostle Paul, starting in verse 25, he goes all the way down through into chapter 5 and verse 7 with a listing of the things that we are to put off and that we are to get rid of and that we're to not have anymore and the the new things we're to put on. And so what he said is it's a whole new wardrobe. So they learn the spiritual secret of putting off and putting on in Ephesians 4.22. Now, look at chapter 5, verse 3. They allowed Christ to deeply penetrate their lives. You see, they weren't just Sunday Christians. They weren't just hearers and not doers. Jesus deeply penetrated their lives. Verse 3. But fornication, all uncleanness or covetousness, that just describes Ephesus. Let it not be once named among you. In fact, it, it, it's amazing. It says in the, the more modern translations, don't even let a hint of that be in your life. Don't, don't allow the old you to creep and seep back in. Get rid of it. Let Christ deeply penetrate your life. Then he continues in verse 4. Uh, Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting. They're not fitting. If you're going to use your mouth for anything, he said, give thanks. Don't be critical. Don't be coarse. Don't be like a lot of the crude humor on American television and radio. Don't be used to that. Don't be listening to it so much that it just becomes a part of your life and that you begin to be like the ungodly. Filthiness, verse 4. Foolishness, verse 4. Coarse jesting. That is, that is joking about what is offensive to the Holy Spirit of God. Don't let that be in your life. Let Christ deeply penetrate your life. Look at verse 12. They didn't just let him deeply uh, penetrate their lives. They renounced all touch with their old ways. Verse 12 says this, For it is shameful even to speak of the things which are done. Now, just as a little application of this, did you know it is possible to know so much about sin that we talk about things that God says it's shameful to even speak about. This 12th verse says that it's shame, it's shameful not just to do those horrible things that are done only in the dark and by the wicked, the unfruitful works of darkness, verse 11. It's shameful to even talk about them and describe what's done by them. Did you know what Paul reduced it to? He said in sin, we should be like children. We should be childlike. 
we don't know all about it. We don't. We can't do a 30-minute oral report on all these sins. We we aren't that well acquainted with it. You can almost tell how acquainted people are with sin by the little words that creep out in their vocabularies. It means that they are so used to sin, they're conversant in it. We're supposed to know it's evil. We're supposed to know what God abhors. But we're supposed to look at verse 12. It's shameful to even speak of those things. Did you know that the old cronies of the devil are the media and culture that keep sin before our eyes, keep it on our minds, and we meditate on sin? And the mind is the entry point of the spirit world. And if we allow this evil and filth to be in our mind, there's an entry point. There is a landing spot. Remember when the Allies, uh, if you read in history, conquered back the Pacific in World War II, what the, the doctrine of the generals were is that if they could just leap over and get an island and, and hammer away and at great loss of, of troops conquer that island, they'll build an air base and then they'll hammer and they leapfrog. They didn't have to conquer every island of the Pacific. They just got these strategic bases so they could leapfrog across the Pacific until they had a base to attack the Japanese. And you see, one, the Japanese knew it. That's why they fought so to the death for every little island because they knew once we had a landing spot, once we had a foothold and took that island, we could leapfrog to another. And see, that's how it is in our lives. We must fight to not let the devil have these landing spots in our life. And the landing spots are, are these listings starting in chapter 4, verse 25. Lying, verse 26. Wrath, verse 27. They give places to the devil all the way through. Corrupt words, verse 29. Uh, the, the filthiness in chapter 5, verse 4. All of those places, if, if yielded to the devil, that ground in our life, gives him a landing spot and he can slowly start permeating the influence to deaden us spiritually. 